Hi, this is Professor Chelsea Starr, and I'm welcoming you to the first lecture of Sociology 101. Um, if you haven't looked at the um, introduction, please go back and look at that video first, and then come to this one. It's really important. It kind of gives you a grounding of what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, well, I am here visiting my relatives in North Carolina, as you can see from all the green trees in the background. I hope that you are in some someplace pleasant and, uh, and that in your video introduction or your discussion board introduction that you share that with me. I would love to know where you're at, what you're doing, who you are. Um, you know, my, my students are people and I love getting to know all of you. So don't be shy, don't be shy. Okay, so I've broken down uh, chapter one of the book into two video lectures because there's really two different themes to what's going on. Um, the first one has to do basically with how sociology came to be. Now, you're responsible for what's in the book, but I'm gonna give you more depth and insight so that what is in the book makes more sense um, instead of just a set of disconnected facts that you read about. Um, so first of all, let's talk about where sociology came from. Close your eyes and picture this. Your family lives on a farm. People have been living on farms for 2,000 years or more. The only thing you have ever seen are trees, cattle, chickens, and crops. Your way of life is agricultural. It's centered around your stable community, your, your, your farm, and nobody has been very far from home. Well, from 1750 to 1850, starting in Europe and later, a little bit later in America, Something came along called industrialization. Very important concept. This was the invention of the first factory. Now, these factories were powered by coal. They had big, noisy, ugly machinery, huge smokestacks that spewed black smoke all up into the air. Um, and around them grew cities. Now, these cities were nothing like humans had ever seen before. And social changes, I mean, when you take people from the country and put them into a city where they have no idea what they're supposed to do, what's going on, um, you've got social change. And the earliest sociologists did what they did to try and explain what was happening to society in this really chaotic time. I mean, these, I, I can't overemphasize, these were things no one had seen before. No one had seen a bunch of people in the city that weren't related to one another. People from all over, child labor. Well, they had seen child labor on the farm, but not in a dark factory. Um, an early sociologist tried to explain what was happening to the human experience as a result of this change in the economy, the change from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. The industrial economy means that you're making stuff in a factory. So you're making cloth, uh, you're making ceramic dishes, you're making something, you're manufacturing. And so 1750 to 1850, lasting a little longer in the States, you had this shift. And this shift, called the Industrial Revolution, coincided with the rise of sociology as a discipline. That's where it came from. Uh, there was change going on, and people were trying to make sense of it. What is happening to my society? This is what they were asking because they saw the real consequences of this change. Now, be sure to look at the PowerPoints that I post for this lecture, because they'll give you some examples of how that came out in the art of the time. And I'll give you some photos so that you have an idea of what life looked like at the time, so it's not just empty words. So check out the PowerPoints too, uh, when you get a chance on Blackboard. 
Okay. Let me back up a little bit. Your book talks about the scientific method. Well, before the scientific method in human history, there had been two ways of making sense of the world. They're called paradigms, way, which is a fancy way of saying make a way to make sense of the world. Uh, the first one is religious. If you were to ask a person in the Middle Ages uh, why something, you know, why bees liked flowers or um, why the king was the king, the answer would be because God said so. And that's the religious paradigm. The second paradigm that arose during the Enlightenment in the 16 and 1700s was philosophy. People tried to explain things in terms of human nature and they asked big questions about why do people do evil things? Where does evil come from? And there were two main philosophers there. One was Hobbes, who was English, and he said people basically are bad and you have to have a strong king to control them otherwise they will do bad things because that the human nature is basically bad people will do what they want to get what they want no matter who they have to step on the other philosopher at the same time in england was john locke and he said no people are creatures of reason and you can reason with them and we can have forms of government that let people govern themselves through the rational, logical process. So those were the two views floating around right before the Industrial Revolution. Well, when the Industrial Revolution came around and sociologists for the first time emerged, Auguste Comte, one of the first, you'll, I'll let you read about him in the book, um, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, um, they began to see that you needed to, this was complicated, and you needed a science to take it apart. That religious thinking wasn't, didn't quite capture what was going on here. And philosophy, human nature, didn't quite capture what was going on. And so they hit on the idea of logical positivism. Now, this, look this up in your book, um, but I'm going to go in a little more detail. Positivism is the idea that is basic to all science. We didn't have a science-based world before this. Positivism is the idea that you learn about the world from observing. The same way that Newton, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, discovered gravity by noticing that apples fell from the tree onto his head, the famous story, um, and surmised the law of gravity from that. That was an observation. Well, emerging sociologists said, amidst all this turmoil that we see, there must be some set of cause and effect, some logical laws governing what is going on here, and if we want to know what they are, we need to observe. We need to observe society. And so empirical observation is a hallmark of positivism. That simply means that instead of sitting in a chair and kind of thinking about it, you go out and you observe people interacting in society. You actually observe them instead of thinking about them philosophically. The other big contribution of positivism was anti-reductionism. And what that means is this. If you have a social issue, you should solve it with social data. If you have a biological issue, solve it with biological data. If you have a religious issue, go to theology, which is the study of religion and those methods. If you have a philosophical problem, go to philosophy and those methods. But if it were a social issue, it deserved to be explained in terms of social data. And that's the main idea behind positivism is that, number one, it's something that is based on observation, which we call data. That observation can be statistical, 
It can be based on interviews. Um, and you'll see your book expands on all the different kinds of data that can be used in sociology. But the main point is when you see the word empirical, that means based on observation. And that's a keystone of positivism. It was a new way of looking at the world. Science was new. We take it for granted, but it wasn't always there. And it really wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that it really started taking over the world. So let me move forward a little bit. <clears throat> the one of the first cities to industrialize was England, London. And what happened was these new factories that were working needed workers. Well, the population, they were all out on the farm. Um, and so they came to the cities seeking wage work. And they were used to an environment where everybody knew everybody, where you were related, you knew your neighbor, you were probably related to your neighbor. And then they went into these, what they would perceive as impersonal cities, where everybody from everywhere was there to make money in these new factories. That was a new form of social life that had never been seen before. And this is what gave rise to sociology. Um, one of the first people to look at this was Emile Durkheim. Uh, and he wrote a groundbreaking work about 1898 called Suicide. And he was the, this was considered the first sociological study that we've ever had. And he looked at statistics about who committed suicide in the different countries in Europe, Northern Europe and Southern Europe, and he looked at their demographics. Now demographics are characteristics like, you know, how old are you? What sex are you? Are you married? Are you single? What's your religion? All of that, you know, census type stuff. What he found in this study was when he gathered statistics from Northern and Southern Europe, was that there were more suicides in the Protestant Northern European countries than there were in the Catholic Southern European countries like Italy and France. And this was the first systematic study where he actually had data to back this up, not just his opinion. It was groundbreaking. And he explained it in terms of social integration. You'll see that in your book. Social integration with Protestants, the emphasis, especially with Calvinists, is between a person's relationship between themselves and God. You don't need a priest to intervene the way you do in Catholicism. It's down to your relationship with God. And Durkheim hypothesized that that led to less social support to keep them going. And in Catholic countries, the priest was the final authority. And if you had a problem, you went to the priest and you went to confession and you would seek out the priest. The relationship was mediated. And Durkheim hypothesized that that was the reason for the lower suicide rate in Catholic countries. Very interesting findings, but the most interesting thing about it is that it was the first study of an incredibly individual act. Suicide is the most individual thing you can do. I mean, that's something someone does on their own. And he showed that there was a social factor involved. That was the birth of sociology. He was able to establish that there was a social factor involved and that you could get at it by gathering data. So that's, that's the most important thing to know about Durkheim for now. Um, another perspective is Karl Marx. He um, came up with what we call conflict theory. And he was writing in England, you know, in the 1700s, 1800s. And he saw these factories going up, and he noticed that 
economically, he was primarily an economist. He wrote on many subjects, um, but he was primarily an economist, and he saw something going on that had never before been observed, and that was this. To put it simply, there were mainly two classes in society, the bourgeois and the proletariat. The bourgeois, or the capitalist, were the people who owned the means of production, which means they owned the way of making a living. They owned the factory. The proletariat, who you can think of as the worker, had nothing to sell but their labor. They were laborers. That's the proletariat. And the way that Marx saw things was that their interests were in conflict. And that's why it's called conflict theory. So we'll go over this in more detail in part two of chapter one. But uh, Marx, as a founding father of sociology, was looking at large groups at the macro uh, aspect of what was going on. And he saw inequality emerging that was worse than they had had under agriculture and started trying to answer those questions. Um, also at the time, later in industrialization, in the early 1900s, you had the feminist sociologists, including Jane Addams, who won a Nobel Prize, who is basically the mother of social work. Um, her work in Chicago was to improve the lives of children and the lives of the poor. She was very active in campaigns against child labor, and uh, basically her work gave rise to the entire profession of social work. It came out of early sociology. Also, you remember our time frame now, 1700s, 1800s, there was a lot of sexism and racism was embedded in the culture. But one early sociologist, the first to uh, the first black man to get a degree in sociology, PhD from Harvard, was W.E.B. Du Bois. And he had a concept of double consciousness. He started thinking about what is it like for a subordinate group to live in society? He said, it's like they have two minds. He said, we've got the one mind that tells us we're black and people are going to interpret us a certain way because we're black. But we've also got the other identity of being American. And what does that mean to us? We have a double consciousness that we have to work towards. So you can, I'm, this is just a tip of the iceberg of the social issues. And you can see how sociology was arising to explain all of this. Um, now, one thing that I want to encourage you to do, having the background on this, is to think about the difference between knowing something by getting the data and knowing something because you heard it on the news or because you uh, it's common sense, everybody knows. If you go to page 23 in your textbook, there's a quiz there. And don't cheat. <laughs> Take take that quiz, go ahead, take it, mark in your book, whatever, on a separate sheet of paper, and then turn the page and see how many you got right. And that will show you the difference, and it'll show you why sociology actually questions common sense. So if everybody knows something, what's the sociologist going to do? The sociologist is going to gather data to see if that common sense is actually true. And so this course is going to be challenging your common sense, but it's on the way to finding the truth. So it's all for the good. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable. And I know from past teaching experience that as students take the class, at first it seems a little weird because when we look at the data, it absolutely contradicts what we thought was just common sense, what everybody knew. Um, here's one example real quick. Um, when people think of people on welfare, 
they tend to think of people of color. But by the numbers, most of the people uh, on welfare in the United States are white. There are a lot of other similar facts. Here's another one for you. Uh, most of the people who have issues with uh, Mexican immigration say that they're draining the system. They're using our hospitals, they're using their schools, they're not paying in. When you look at the data, they're paying in more than they use. They might be paying it in under false social security numbers, but they're paying it in. And so a lot of what we think we know when subjected to the test of actual fact, we have to revise what we think in the light of new data. That's what science is. So thank you for watching and I look forward to talking to you about social theory in the next lecture.